Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. From bench to bedside, what to consider when translating to clinical grade cytokines. I am Cassie Saltman of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Milton e Biotech. To learn more, visit www.miltonybiotech.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box to the left and click Submit. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also use the Ask a Question box to let us know if you are having any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker for today's event, Dr. Lars Franken, Group Leader, Cytokines and Cell Culture Reagents, Milton e. Biotech. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography on the left of your screen. Dr. Franken, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for the introduction and also a very warm welcome from um, my side to the second part of our webinar series on clinical grade cytokines. You may have already participated in the first part of the webinar series, which was focusing on the efficient use of um, research use only cytokines. So now this time we are going to have a look at their cousins, the um, clinical grade cytokines. And in the next 30 to 40 minutes, I plan to give you um, a little overview about their regulatory status and maybe a few tips and tricks that you might be able to employ when you plan to translate to clinical grade cytokines, but also some um, caveats that you might want to um, avoid. So with that, let's jump right in. So here you can see a brief overview about the three main topics um, we are going to touch today. And on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see the title um, that I have given this slide, um, or basically the whole webinar, which is clinical grade cytokines are not just another reagent. Uh, although by many people, they are treated as a commodity, um, hopefully in this webinar today, I can dissuade you of this notion and demonstrate to you that by carefully choosing the right clinical grade cytokines, your cell manufacturing process can um, benefit tremendously from that. So I will do this by going along three points. So first of all, I will um, show you the regulatory framework around clinical grade cytokines. Then obviously, as these are meant for cellular therapy, we have to talk about the safety aspect. Yeah? These two things, regulations and safety, they are obviously must-haves. But as cell manufacturing also comes with huge costs and investments, there is also an efficiency aspect we have to talk about. Yeah? And today, um, I will also show you one or two tricks um, you can apply to use your clinical grade cytokines more efficient and hopefully save a little bit of the costs that you would maybe otherwise have invested into these products. But before we start talking about clinical grade cytokines, let me very briefly recap the take home message of the first part of this webinar series which focused on the basic of cytokine activity. And the reason I would like to do this is because um, these informations are basically the foundations of a lot of things I am going to talk about today. So if you haven't watched this webinar already, maybe consider watching it, the recording after this webinar, or if you're watching a recording of this webinar, maybe consider to pause now and go back and watch the first part of this series. Um, so for all other people who would not like to do this, here is a very brief summary of what uh, the first webinar entailed. So first of all, you need to know that biological activity is basically the ability of a cytokine to induce um, a certain biological effect. So for example, talking about IL-2, um, the biological effect would mean the ability of IL-2 to induce um, proliferation in the T cells. And different batches of IL-2 would have a certain biological activity and this is production related. So for more details, again, please consider the first webinar. So what is then really, really important is to know that these activity values, um, which are measured via bioassays, they are only relative values, meaning you cannot really compare them to one another unless 
they have been calibrated um, by international standards. And only if you have cytokines um, whose assay has been calibrated in such a way, then you can start using the advantages of activity-based cytokine dosing, because then you will be able to cut reagents expenses because you don't need to overdose. You will be able to increase reproducibility and comparability in your assays because you will be able to add just the right amount of cytokine to your assay. And this will also keep your cells happy because if you overdose or if you have continuously varying cytokine concentrations, then this will obviously not be a good thing for your um, processes or for your experiments. Okay, so, and with that, um, let's move on. So on this slide, you can see the challenges that you face um, when you're dealing with research or with clinical applications. So on the left-hand side in red, you can see um, the challenges for research applications are, for example, reproducibility issues, cost pressure, time pressure. And in the first webinar, um, we have already shown to you um, how you can alleviate these challenges by using um, cytokines with lot specific activity. But today we are talking about clinical applications and there you are facing completely different challenges, right? Because there are regulatory issues um, and safety issues are two concerns that are most likely pretty much absent from, from research applications. Um, and you're obviously also dealing with a huge pressure to um, to use your expensive clinical reagents efficiently. Yeah? And this is completely clear that the challenges are different because when you look at research, what the end product of your of your project is, most likely it's a publication. Yeah? But when you are dealing with clinical applications, the end product is ideally a drug that can be given to a patient. And therefore, obviously, the first part that we need to talk about when talking about clinical grade cytokines are the regulations. So as I've just said, the end goal of a clinical project is usually a drug. And because this is the case, there are a few gentlemen worldwide which would really like to have a word with you about that. So um, what you can see here are, is an overview about the regulatory agencies um, worldwide, being the most important, the um, FDA in um, the US and the um, EMA in, in Europe. And um, for cell therapies, a lot of regulations um, exist that suppliers or developers of these cell therapies must follow. And um, let us now have a look where our clinical grade cytokines would fall into this regulatory framework. So when you're talking about a cell therapy, um, there are different kinds of materials um, involved. So what you can see here is a schematic depiction of the workflow on a Clinimax prodigy. So you start with your blood product, then you have several modification steps. Um, and in the end, then you have a final cellular product. Yeah? So this is how this would look like. So you have your, for example, CAR T cells in a buffer and these um, cells are what called the API. So that's the active pharmaceutical ingredient. So that is basically the active part of the drug in the medicinal product. The buffer in which the cells are contained is a so-called excipient. Yeah? So this is um, anything that is in the final cell product, but that is not the active um, substance. Yeah? When we are talking about clinical grade cytokines, these are so-called ancillary materials. So they're called so in the US or raw materials in the European Union. And those are components that are used during the manufacturing of the cellular product, but they are not intended to be present in the final product formulation. And because of that, different regulations apply to them than to the API and to the excipient. So if you look at the excipient and the API, obviously both of them are very, very heavily regulated. And you can see a short um, excerpt of some of the regulations that apply on the left-hand side. And actually that is not really important because that is not what we're going um, to talk about today. All that you know is that this are, there are binding regulations which affect the excipient and the API. 
when you now look at the ancillary materials, it might surprise you a little bit um, that there is actually no real binding guideline for these materials. And this might especially be surprising because I made this point about regulation being very important, so prominent at the start of this webinar. So does that mean that actually you can do what you want and there is no guideline for silly materials, so you can use whatever you wish? Yeah, so I mean, as you um, might have thought, this is obviously not the case. Yeah, so there are a couple of different guidelines in place um, which describe how developers of cell therapy should deal with ancillary materials. Yeah, so these are, there are, for example, chapters both in the US and the European Pharmacopeia, so the USP 1043 or the 5.2.12 in the European Pharmacopeia. Um, then there is an ISO guidelines, the 2399, all ancillary materials. Um, very often, CGMP guidelines, at least in part, um, are used for the manufacturing of ancillary materials. There are ISO guidelines describing quality management. Um, and if you have um, cytokines, which are derived from a mammalian source, also ICH guidelines for virus safety are relevant. Yeah? But what you need to know is that these guidelines are all more or less non-binding, um, or at least are non-binding for ancillary materials, like for example, the um, CGMP guidelines. And because that is the case, what the regulatory bodies are going to do, um, they are basically doing a risk-based approach. So all ancillary materials you are going to employ in the cell manufacturing um, are put into one of four risk categories. So you go from tier one, which is very low risk, to tier four, which is high risk. So tier one would be, for example, medicinal products themselves. Yeah? So these are very highly qualified materials with the intended use as therapeutic drugs. So for example, um, recombinant human insulin, or there's like a recombinant IGF-1. If you would employ that in your cellular therapy, the risk actually would be very, very, very low because the component you're going to use is actually intended to be injected into a patient. So then you have the tier two, which are the so-called GMP reagents. So these are very well characterized materials which are intended to be used as ancillary materials. Yeah, so for example, all our max GMP cytokines, media, and transact would fall under this um, category. And it is also very important to know that these um, tier two ancillary materials, they're all developed and produced under a quality management system. So then you have the tier three, which is basically research reagents. Yeah, so materials which are not intended to be used as an ancillary material, um, they are rather intended for research use or preclinical development use. So the research use only cytokines, the premium grade cytokines we discussed in the first webinar, for example, would fall into this category. And then you have um, tier four, so the very high risk category, um, where you have um, any material that is not produced under a quality management system and this is derived from an animal source. So for example, um, serum derived from animals, so FBS, would fall under this um, category. So as I've just told you, most of the clinical OGMP cytokines fall into this tier two, so the low risk category. Um, there is, however, one additional detail that you must be aware of when you are developing a cell therapy, yeah? and that is that the responsibility that the materials you buy, the ancillary materials you buy, cytokines, media, um, the responsibility lies with the developer of the cell therapy, that these materials are suitable for the cell therapy. And because this can very, very often be a challenging task, um, for example, we here at Milton e, we try our very best to develop these ancillary materials to the highest standards so that you do not have to worry about this too much. So maybe to illustrate this a little bit more, yeah, what you can see here is a comparison of the product features between our premium grade cytokines and the max GMP cytokines. So here, for example, um, you can see the QC testing that is done on these products. And you can see at very first glance that the QC testing for the MaxJMP cytokines is obviously a lot more extensive. Yeah, so in addition 
to the specific activity, purity, and endotoxin content, you'll also get um, information on protein content, identity, um, host cell contaminants such as DNA and protein, sterility, product rated impurity, and mycoplasma, depending on the protein. Even more important than the QC testing are the regulations which are the cytokines complied with. And you can see the premium grade cytokines, they are developed under an ISO 9001 quality management system. And again, you can see that for the max GMP cytokines, um, the compliance is much more extensive because the GMP cytokines are compliant not only with ISO 9001, but also on top of that with ISO 35.5, um, ICHQ5A for virus safety, and the chapters on ancillary materials and raw materials in the two um, pharmacopias. And also the documentation is much more extensive. Both of them, both quality grades get a certificate of analysis or product quality certificate, as it is called for the max GMP cytokines, you get a data sheet, a package insert. But on top of that, for the max GMP cytokines, you will get um, a certificate of origin, you will get a TSE, BSE statement, you get a product information file where all, all the information about this product, including manufacturing details, um, details on testing, for example, for virus safety, etc., cetera, is, is documented. Um, and you also have a batch documentation for these cytokines. And all of this we do and we provide to reduce the risk for the customers which are associated with the ancillary materials to an absolute minimum. Um, because you will now see in a second why it makes sense basically to be compliant with as many regulations as possible, because now we are going to have a look at how regulatory bodies actually judge the suitability of ancillary materials. So what regular bodies would do is they would check if the ancillary material in question is compliant with certain specifications and, and guidelines. So for example, with the ISO 3485, how about animal derived components in the ancillary material? Are they compliant with the pharmacopoeias? Is there a TSE, BSG risk evaluation? What about sterility? If you are using a cytokine from a mammalian source, is it compliant with ICH, um, Q5A? And based on the finding if you are compliant or not. So if you are compliant, this would greatly facilitate approval because this would just take a checkbox at the regulatory body, perfect, you are compliant with the ICH Q5A. So we don't need to worry about viral safety too much. However, if you're not compliant with one of these guidelines, this will usually trigger more questions and data requests from the regulatory body. And this will nearly always lead to developmental delays it will incur additional costs because maybe you have to generate some data on something. You have to prove that something is safe. And as a worst case scenario, it might even lead to rejection of approval or at least um, rejecting to approve a certain ancillary material to be used with the cellular therapy. And that then would mean that you would need to develop the process all over again or find a new ancillary material for that. And that is really nothing um, you want. So before we go on, let me very, very briefly sum up what we have just learned. So first of all, um, GMP cytokines are so-called ancillary materials, and there is no real binding regulation on them. However, there is a lot of very relevant non-binding guidelines, um, such as the USP uh, 1043 and the um, Euro uh, European Pharmacopoeia 5.2.12. And what regulatory bodies will do is they will do a risk-based approach, right? So they will check if there is compliant with these non-guiding guidelines, and it will be hugely favorable um, and reduce the risk um, of effort intensive follow-ups if you are compliant with these results. Yeah? And this is now why you can see why it makes a lot of sense that we try when we sell our mixed GMP cytokines that we want to be compliant with as many of these guidelines as is possible. But coming back to the evaluation um, of the compliance with different um, with different guidelines. There are two key factors which are very often overlooked and which I would like to address a little bit in more detail. And this is the sterility and the compliance with the ICHQ5A, so the so-called viral safety. And these two are topics which fall both under the regulations and also under the safety aspect.
So let us start off with the sterility. What are the recommendations actually for ancillary materials? And I've put you some excerpts from the ISO and from the European Pharmacopeia here. Um, so ISO says that you should use validated tests with sufficient quantity, and these tests may include sterility. Um, and the European Pharmacopeia says a raw material is sterile and produced under aseptical conditions. Otherwise, the level of contamination must be known. So basically this says and silver materials, they should be sterile. Otherwise, you need to justify um, why the risk of using non-sterile materials is acceptable. But what does sterility in a regulatory sense actually mean? So it is not enough just to do a sterility test according to one of the pharmacopias. And I will demonstrate you why this is the case. Down below, you can see that you see um, sample which is taken out of a batch of clinical cytokine. And you can see this is an example, you have no contamination, all is good. If you have a high rate of contamination, represented here by the red vials, um, the detection of these contaminated vials by the QC sample is very likely. But if you have a low detection percentage, then actually the detection um, by the QC vial is not so likely anymore. And depending on the size of the batch, let's say a couple of thousand vials, 5% contaminated vials and the QC size of 20 vials for the sterility testing, there might be a chance, which is like nearly one third, um, that the contamination might go unnoticed, even if you use um, uh, a sterility test from the pharmacopoeia. And because of that, a lot of the GMP cytokines out there actually cannot be considered sterile. So, what would you then need to be sterile in a regulatory sense? First of all, you need the sterility test according to the pharmacopoeia. But as we just discussed, this alone is not enough to ensure um, sterility. What you will need on top is a validated aseptical filling procedure, meaning um, a validation that demonstrates that your whole filling process is um, able to guarantee sterile products in the end. If you now want to buy such a clinical cytokine and you want to make sure that you really buy a sterile one, what do you need to take care of? Well, what you need to do is you need to look at the certificate of analysis and check if it basically spells out the word sterile there. If you just see something like this, so sterility test according to USP, past or bio burden sterility, no growth, this is actually not sufficient. It means that the sterility test most likely has been passed, but that there is no validated aseptical filling procedure for this product available. Yeah. So this, these products then would not be sterile in a regulatory sense, and this would of course incur a higher risk for your cellular product as well. So how can you see if the cytokine is really sterile? If this is the case, then this is displayed on the certificate of analysis or product quality certificate as we call it. And what you can see here is an example, our Max JPR2, and within the red border, I've zoomed this in a little bit for you, you can see you have a sterility test according to the European Pharmacopeia, and the result of the specification is really sterile. So it's spelled out on the certificate of analysis. If it's not spelled out, then it is not sterile. Now, so these are basically the two things you need to look out for. Is there a sterility test according to the European or US pharmacopoeia? And is there a validated aseptical filling procedure? This is the case. You have a product which is sterile in regulatory sense, and this will be, of course, a product which incurs a much, much lower risk to your cellular therapy. A second very important safety aspect that is often forgotten is the virus safety if you are using cytokines which are derived from a mammalian cell such as true or hex cells. Um, when you're filing for a BLA application or a marketing authorization, you need to demonstrate that you have proper virus safety tests in place. And what would these virus safety tests comprise? Again, as for the sterility, this is a two-step process. And as for the sterility, the second step of this process is very often forgotten or omitted which can later then cause a lot of regulatory concerns. So the first step is um, a very straightforward test of the actual viral contamination. So you take a product, you take it into medium stages of the product, you run virus tests on them, and then you see what the actual viral load is. But again, this is not enough. As for the sterility, you need 
to have a validated process. You need to have a process that has demonstrated, should there be any viruses present, my process can reduce them to an acceptable um, level. And in order to test that is what you need to do is you will spike virus into different um, intermediate steps of your process. You will then run a certain manufacturing step and you do a before and after analysis. And then you check how much this manufacturing step is able to reduce the viral load. And now you have to do this for both enveloped and non-enveloped viruses. And for each of them, you have to show that two steps, two separate steps, um, can reach a viral reduction factor of eight blocks combined. And only then a regulatory body would basically consider the virus safety of your product to be adequate. And this is why, for example, um, all next GMP cytokines, which are derived from Joe cells, um, we are compliant with the ACH Q5A, meaning we have both the test of the actual viral contaminations and we have the validated viral clearance procedures in order to make sure that later on during regulatory review, um, there are no unpleasant surprises for you. So with these things clarified, um, let us now move on to one final aspect, which um, is important for the safety of the product, but which is also very often overlooked. So when you receive a um, certificate of analysis, what you will usually see is something like this. You have a lot of required different tests, you have the specifications, but then the results for most of these specifications will only give you a pass. They will not tell you, for example, what the actual endotoxin content is. They will not tell you what the actual purity is. Yeah? Um, and while on the first glance, these exact QC results, they might seem unnecessary, um, they can actually be invaluable because you really need to know what you feed to your cells. And I will now give you an example why it is really important to have the exact QC results for your different batches. Um, with an example on the troubleshooting that occurs after you had problems during your manufacturing procedure. So let us assume you're running a QC of your latest batch of your cell therapy and you have tested, um, produced and tested four batches, A to D, and one of the parameters you have checked is the number of viable cells. And what you can see here is um, batch A and B, everything looks fine, you have nearly 100% viable cells, but then uh, for batch C and D, the number of viable cells drop to like 60%, and that is obviously um, worrisome, and that is not something you would like to see. So, and up in closer inspections, you now realize that batches A and B, where everything is okay, um, and batches C and D, where you have the problems with the viability, they were actually produced with two different batches of cytokines. And if you have a look at the certificates of analysis or the PQC, they actually don't really offer any solutions, right? It's all, all the same specifications are all fulfilled. Actually, it looks good at a first glance. But if you would have exact PQC results, that would reveal the suspect immediately. Because if you look at now at the numbers, you would realize that the second batch, so IL-2, F2, used to manufacture the cell therapy batches with the problems, contains nearly 100 times more endotoxin than the first batch. Yeah? So while both batches are very well within their um, defined specifications, the endotoxin contents vary more than 100%. And obviously, this is something that you, as a manufacturer of cell therapy, you should know that. It is actually a little bit like with icebergs. Yeah? So very, very often specifications are very easily perceived as accurate content because you don't have any other number available. But you have to keep in mind that these specifications, there are actually just upper limits. And you have no clue. Yeah, you can just see the surface of the sea. You have no idea what is going on below the surface. You can have a very, very low um, contamination, or you can have a contamination that basically reaches the specification without having QC results, exact QC results. You will never be able to tell the difference.
So, and now again, before moving on, yeah, please let me sum up the second part related to safety of this webinar. So, we have learned that two caveats um, or two things that are very often overlooked are sterility and virus safety. So, for regulatory sterility, you will need both a sterility test and a validation of the aseptical filling. The bio burden test alone is not sufficient. And furthermore, if you have cytokines from mammalian sources, make sure that the cytokines you buy are compliant with the ACHQ5A to later avoid troubles in the regulatory review. And finally, you've just seen, or hopefully I have demonstrated to you, that it is really in your best interest to know the exact UC results um, so that you can really um, have an efficient process development, or if it comes to that, um, you know where to start when doing troubleshooting. Eh? And for this reason, for example, all the MaxJMP cytokines come with PQCs where you can see all the exact results of the QC tests. Okay then, so let's move on to the last topic of today. So now we are going to talk about the efficient use of um, clinical grade cytokines and how you can get the most out of the cytokines you buy. So a while back, we did a survey, and what we found during that survey actually surprised us. We asked, um, we asked the participants of the survey how do they compare different cytokine products before they choose their vendor. And what we found, as you can see this in the diagram here, is that actually most customers, they trust either the specified values on paper or they do not test or compare the cytokines at all. And this is a valid method, you can do that, but this approach is based on two very critical assumptions. And the first one is you have to choose the correct activity value for your cost calculation. So this is the first thing I'm going to address in the following slides. And the second thing is obviously also the specified activity needs to be reliable. And this is also something that we will come to look at on the following slides. So maybe let us first talk about what different activity specifications there are for clinical grade cytokines. And then let's talk about which one of them to choose um, when you calculate your cost. So first of all, there is the so-called minimal activity. That is the activity that a cytokine needs to have to pass QC. It is not the activity that this specific lot has. It is just the activity it needs to pass QC. That's the activity that's basically guaranteed. Then you have the so-called typical activity. Yeah? So this is basically the average activity over all the lots of this cytokine. Yeah? So it gives you a very good impression what, on average, if you buy a lot of cytokine lots, what activity you can expect on average. And then finally, you have the so-called lot-specific activity. Yeah? And this is the activity that a specific lot you buy has. Yeah? So for all our max GMP cytokines and premium grade cytokines, we always supply you with lot specific activities that you can accurately dose your cytokine. And what you can see here is that obviously the minimal activity is different and usually a lot lower than the typical activity or the lot specific activity. So now let's talk about which of these activity values to use to calculate your costs. So first of all, very, very common caveat is that a lot of people use minimal activities to calculate their cost. And this results to a very drastic overestimation of the costs, right? If you look at that, obviously it's very simple actually, and it's pretty straightforward, but a lot of people really don't think so much on this. They just see the activity value and they use it to calculate the costs. Um, and as you can see here, if you do that, and if you calculate the costs with a minimal activity of, let's say, 1 million units, um, while the typical activity is actually 5 million units, you're actually overestimating your costs also by a factor of 5. Yeah? So this is definitely not an ideal scenario. Well, now you would say, okay then, so I just use my lot specific activity, right, to calculate the costs. So you ask the supplier to send over a certificate of analysis, and then you check the lot specific activity, and then you calculate your costs. But this might also not be the best idea, because if you, like 
if you remember the first webinar, I hope you do. Cytokine activities can really vary between different lots. Yeah? And if you, by chance, get a certificate or if by chance the supplier has a lot on sale that doesn't have such a high activity, then obviously, again, you will calculate with a low activity, meaning high costs for you. If by chance you receive a certificate from a lot that has a high activity, you might be surprised how low the costs actually are because the activity is so high. But if this is not the typical activity, again, th then you might be underestimating um, the costs that you have. Yeah? So you also need to be very careful when using a lot specific activity. So what's the trick now? I mean, there's only one activity type left, right? And that is a typical activity. So in this graph here on the left, you can basically see, you see the blue dots that represent single batches and the dotted line is the typical activity. Yeah, And you can see the more single batches you include into your calculation very quickly, um, this gets close to the typical activity. Yeah, So in most cases, using typical activity for your cost calculation, especially for long-term projects, that gives you actually a very, very good estimation of the costs. And if your cytokine supplier doesn't provide typical activity, usually you can always ask for the typical activity of the cytokines. So to sum this up, you can use lot specific activity to calculate the cytokine costs for your project. But usually it makes sense to do so for smaller projects where you can just buy a whole um, cytokine lot or all the vials you need from one lot. And then you can make sure that in the course of this project, you only use cytokines from one batch. And then your cost calculation obviously is perfectly accurate. But for larger projects, and I would say most cellular manufacturing um, developments fall into this category, you need to know the typical activity. Otherwise, you won't be able to really um, estimate realistic costs for your cytokines. And however, for both of these, one prerequisite would be that the activities which are specified, so which are given to you by the supplier, they need to be reliable. And that is the next thing we're going to have a look at. So in order to check how reliable cytokine activity actually is, what we did is we measured cytokines from different suppliers side by side using our calibrated bioassays. And then we compared how close the specified activity um, was to the value that we actually measured. Now you can see the results depicted here in this graph, where the dotted line indicates the specified activity and the bars represent the actual measured activity. So overall, the good news is that the specified values are often rather reliable. Yeah, while you can see some deviation from the specified values, you have to remember that bioassays just so show some variability yeah, and therefore you have to allow for some wiggle room, meaning that most of the results are perfectly okay. We were, however, really, really surprised to find that for certain cytokines and suppliers, the measured activity values really deviate very, very significant from the specified activities. And one of the cytokines for which this was the case was IL-15. So if you look at the left-hand side um, on the upper graph, you can see um, a representation of the minimal and typical activities claimed for three different IL-15 products. And on the right-hand part of the graph, you can see the actual measured activity values. So these are all relative values, and we have normalized them to the typical activity of our MaxGMP IL-15, um, which we have used as a reference in these experiment sets. And you can clearly see that there is an IL-15 product for which the supplier claims more than 2,000% of the typical activity of our IL-15. But when you now look at the data from the actual side-to-side -side measurements, you can clearly see that this cytokine was actually only half as active as our reference IL-15. Um, you can see a zoomed-in version of the data graph in the lower part of the picture on the left-hand side. And if you now put these numbers into perspective, so the claimed and the actual activity of this product, you will find that this IL-15 product only delivers around 2% of what it claims to offer. And honestly, I would say that is actually pretty dramatic. And it demonstrates that while most specified activities are reliable, to minimize risks, you should never blindly trust values you've just seen on paper.
And if you then combine this with the approach that a lot of cell therapy developers um, pursue, namely not really testing the cytokines, but just relying on the specifications, obviously there is a certain risk that you might buy one of the cytokines where the specifications are actually not accurate. Uh, and because you will never realize that there would be cytokines out there which will offer a lot more, let's say, bang for the buck, um, you would actually have pretty high costs without realizing it. And obviously, there is actually a really simple way to, to prevent something like this. Yeah? And this is not to rely on specified values, but to really go ahead if you're interested or if you are translating to, to GMP cytokines, buy and test cytokine products from different cytokine vendors before you choose. Um, if you're interested in how to do this, we offer an, an app note that describes that a little bit. And I can really not stress that enough, that this is a really, really good idea. Yeah. Um, so not only will you realize if there are um, unreliable activities, but what you will also realize is if the cytokine works well um, in the context of your process. Yeah? Because what you also have to remember is that all these activity data that you see on these um, data sheets and, and certificates of analysis, it's, it's all data derived from artificial bioassays. Yeah? Um, this is the gold standard and this is the best that you can do from a supplier perspective, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it also works exactly the same in your manufacturing process. Yeah? So the best and most responsible thing that you can actually do is um, to test these cytokine beforehand. Yeah? And if there are any questions to that um, later on, um, I would be happy to, to answer questions to that and also outside of the context of this webinar um, to help you with that. So. As a very, very last tip, um, there is another thing I would like to share with you, and that is um, when to translate to GMP cytokines. And um, I'm going to swim a little bit um, upriver, so against the current here, um, because what a lot of people will tell you is to switch as early as possible during process development, right? So that you work with what you use in your actual process, and that reduces the risk. And this is actually a great idea, but let me walk you through this and maybe I can give you another perspective on that. So what you can see here is the um, other phases or a schematic representation of the phases you usually have when you're developing um, a clinical product. So you have your preclinical development where you have like initial R&D, proof of concept. Then you have like a prolonged phase of, of process development we are testing and defining the optimal parameters of your manufacturing process. Um, usually have a high number of experiments in this phase. Then you have your clinical um, phases with ever increasing numbers of patient runs. And then obviously, hopefully, at the end of that stands the biological license application or the market authorization, um, where the process then is finally fixed and regulated. And the number of patient runs obviously gets higher and higher. But there is also another way to display that, and that is when we display the number of runs or the reagent consumption in the different phases. And what you can immediately see is this huge bubble in process development, right? Because usually in process development, the number of experience is really high, and you have to use a lot of reagents. Um, while this might not necessarily be true for every development process, let me say that is at least a pattern that I have observed with a lot of customers. Um, and you usually consume a lot more in process development than even in the early, in the early clinical phases. Yeah. And what's usually recommended is, so you start, you do your R&D with um, research reagents. They are a little bit cheaper, um, but you actually don't know a lot of the relevant parameters. For example, for most research cytokines, you don't know a lot of specific activity. Yeah. And that is why it's very often recommended to switch to more expensive um, GMP cytokines early in process development on. Yeah? Develop your process with what you're going to use later on to reduce the risk. Now, in this case, for example, I would agree, if you don't know the lot-specific activity of your research cytokine, 
then you need to switch to a GMP cytokine because you need to, um, you run the process with the correct activity. Yeah. But what you can do is if you, for example, go with our premium grade cytokines, um, because if you might remember the first webinar, we're actually the only, Miltani is the only supplier where you will get the lot specific activity. Um, you can actually extend the use of research use only cytokines a lot deeper into the process development because you know all the relevant parameters yeah? and then switch to the more expansive max GMP cytokines later on because these two cytokines they are truly translatable yeah um, because unless you know the lot specific activity both for the research and for the GMP cytokines the products are not truly translatable and if you do this because you can use the more cost efficient research cytokines in the process development, this will save you a lot of money, but your process won't suffer from it because you can easily switch out one of the cytokines for the other. Yeah, so, and with that, we would be at the end of the third chapter of um, this webinar. So let me sum this up. So, First of all, for efficiency, it's very important that you know what activity types are out there and how reliable activity specifications actually are. Um, typical caveats would be to use the incorrect activity specification for your cost calculations and not to perform side-by-side -side comparison before choosing a cytokine vendor. And finally, there is an opportunity to reduce costs in process development, and that is by using the lot specific activity of our premium grade cytokines um, and to switch to the cost intensive GMP cytokines later in the development process. And with that, because I'm not now talking for nearly 45 minutes, um, I've tried to reduce it even a little bit further to just a few take home messages. So. If we're talking about regulation and compliance, try to choose the cytokines which offer the highest uh, compliance with guidelines such as USP 1043, European Pharmacopeia, ISO, ICH. The more guidelines the cytokines are compliant with, the better for you, the less worries you have. Um, if we're talking about safety, always try to choose sterile cytokines sterile meaning in a regulatory sense. If you're buying the mailing cytokines, make sure they're compliant with the ICHQ5A. And if you can, choose cytokines which offer you a transparent analysis certificate so that you really know the QC results. And if you really want to use your cytokines um, efficiently, and if you don't want to spend more money than needed, perform cyber side tests before choosing a cytokine vendor. And um, use researchers only cytokines with lot specific activity to reduce the huge cost you will encounter early in your process development. Yeah. And with that, I would really thank you for your attention and for being um, my guests for the past 45 minutes. And um, here's also a very short disclaimer. And with that, I would conclude today's webinar, move to the Q&A session, and I would really be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Franken, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just type your question into the Ask Question box and click Submit. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's go ahead and get started. Our first question that we have here says, so when you're saying that clinical cytokines are basically not regulated, does that mean I could in theory also use a research use only product for our manufacturing process? Yeah, so that is, a, yeah, so that is actually a very good question, and one might think that. So the answer to this question is basically what is available on the market. Yeah. So if you have um, no clinical version of the cytokine available, you might indeed be able to use research use only 
um, reagents or products for a process. But the further along you go in the clinical development, the more difficult it will get. Uh, so, um, and when there is um, a clinical or GMP version available, then usually the regulatory body will make you use um, this version. I hope this answers the question. Great, thank you. Um, our next question here says, with regards to your remarks of specified activities being unreliable, what is the point of the values on the data sheets if you cannot trust them? <laughs> yeah, okay, so that's a very good question. Um, I would put it like this, right? I mean, um, it's, it's just a few bad apples, so to say. I usually, I mean, and I think I also said this um, during, during the webinar, um, most of the specified activities you can actually trust and they are reliable but right i mean if you are if you're talking about developing a cell therapy it's all about reducing risk right you do not want to take the risk that you on accident caught one of these apples yeah so this is the first part of the answer the second part of the answer is um as i said when you develop a cell therapy um it, it has a specific manufacturing procedure right and when we do um measure the activities of these cytokines, we do so in a artificial bioassay. And these artificial bioassays, they are very great at making cytokine activities comparable yeah, between different batches from, from, let's say, Miltony or from another vendor, if they are calibrated. But still, cytokines may behave a little bit differently when they are put into your assay, right? And that's um, the second reason that you should be, yeah, let's say, critical about these products and that you should really test them in your own essay before you use them and you should not rely just on paper values. Thank you. We have another question here from the audience. And again, I want to reiterate, if you do have a question here for our speaker, please submit them in the ask a question box in the lower left corner and we'll try to get to your question during our live. Our next question here says, if virus safety is such a huge issue, is it not better to choose cytokines derived from E. coli, or do you also need to provide virus tests for them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very, very good question that um, actually we get often from customers. So in general, you do not need to provide virus tests if the cytokine um, is derived from an E. coli host. Um, you only need to do so if your cytokine was produced in a um, mammalian cell. Um, and yes, at a first glance, you could say there is an increased risk if you have cytokines from mammalian hosts. And this is why also the FDA or other regulatory bodies are a little bit more strict on that. But you have to see that there are always reasons that certain cytokines are expressed in um, mammalian cells. And mostly the, um, it's that the expression and the activity are just better. So an E. coli maybe cannot do the glycosylation or anything like that, right? And then, then you're at the point where you add a trade-off. So you have to decide, um, so is quality the most, like um, virus safety, for example, the most important issue, if there is an E. coli version, maybe you want to switch to that, or is it actually performance? And then you would go with the mammalian cytokine, right? And in a lot of cases, some cytokines you can only express in the mammalian system. Fantastic, thank you. All right, our next question that we have here says, when you talked about the different guidelines and how the FDA evaluates cytokines, does that mean regulatory bodies will reject ancillary materials automatically if they're not compliant with the guidelines or if they are not sterile? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, th this connects a little bit to the first question, right? So um, no, they will not do that. Um, the the part the, the tricky thing about the ancillary material is that this it's not like for drug products like a checklist where you can say okay yeah we ticked all we ticked all the check boxes and if you did it you're good and if you don't do it you you won't get approval. Um, being compliant with as much guidelines as possible it will reduce the risk of the regulatory body asking nasty questions or maybe. Um, requiring more data, yeah, but it doesn't mean that you cannot use a cytokine or ancillary material which does not comply with all of the regulations or which is not sterile, for example. It just means that most likely you will have to invest a lot of more issue uh, and effort into this whole regulatory part, right? 
I mean, that's basically the reason why, for example, we try to be compliant with as many guidelines as possible. So that basically we have done already most of this regulatory framework and customers don't need to bother with it. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have another question here. We are a small company with limited resources for regulatory questions. If we buy cytokines, which follow all the guidelines you mentioned, are we then safe with regards for questions from the MD? Oh, I'm sorry, FDA. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this goes in the, in the, in the same direction, right? Um, yeah, this is, so this is a thing that we encounter very often with like smaller biotechs or, or academics, which just don't have like really a regulatory division. Um, and because there is no, um, th th there, th the guidelines are not binding, there is a lot of uncertainty about these ancillary materials and very often smaller companies um, struggle to know what exactly to do. So I can just only advise you if you have a good cytokine supplier or a good cytokine vendor, and I would say that we are, for example, um, you can always ask also your cytokine vendor to support you with this, right? I mean, for example, we, we will support you, you know, if you have regulatory questions, um, you can always um, contact our tech support and um, we will help you with that. Following all the regulations, no, I mean, as I said before, it reduces the risk of the, of the FDA asking um, questions. It's, it's not a 100%, right? Um, it, it always depends on the interplay of the ancillary material with your process. Um, yeah, but if you have any problems with that, I mean, you can, you can try, uh, contact us. Uh, we, we'll be happy to help. Great, thank you. We have another question here. How variable are things like purity or host cell contaminations? If it is important to know the exact QC result, is it then not the case that the specification is not stringent enough? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, that's another very good question. And yeah, I mean, you could think that, right? The moment, um, so first of all, all all ancillary materials, they will, at least the ones expressed recombinantly, they will contain some degree of impurities, mostly from the host cell. And as most recombinant um, proteins are derived from E. coli, so it's most likely bacterial stuff that you would just have in there. Um, and yeah, I mean, these specifications are set basically on the standard or, or the average that is known to be safe. Um, but, but the point is safety here. It doesn't say it cannot have an effect on your manufacturing process, right? So manufacturing processes are different. And these specifications are chosen in a way that they are what we know, like the app for the average process, these are working well. Yeah, but obviously, if you produce cytokines, and if you design a cytokine product, you cannot do every possible application justice. You cannot do every possible way a customer might employ this justice, right? So there might be processes or manufacturing processes out there which are more sensitive. And for these processes, you just need to know that, yeah? Um, means these specifications, they are all sound and very and good and accepted by, by the FDA, yeah? But for sensitive processes, it might play a role and it would be good to know the exact QC results because before you do your manufacturing process, before you set everything up, you don't know if you have a sensitive process, right? Exactly. Perfect. So it looks like we have time for just one more question today. <coughs> it My says, apologies. you said that side-by-side -side testing is very important, but we only have limited resources. What would be the most important things to consider to be as efficient as possible? Mm -hmm. Okay, so for that, it would be so two things I would say would be really, really important. So if you spend your time on doing side by side testing, first of all, you need to know roughly where you start, right? You remember this dose response curve, so you have like a lower plateau where um, not much is going on, and then you have like a, a top plateau where rather independent of the concentration you apply, um, the biological effect will not change that much, right? So that would be the first thing. If you're doing side by side tests, be very, very sure you're not in this top plateau because then you will not be able to see any difference between the cytokines. So that would be the first thing. Make sure 
you are in the linear range of your essay. And um, the second thing is kind of, you need to know where you start, right? Um, so are you starting with a nanogram based approach, for example, so you have no idea, let's say you have no idea where you are in the curve, then you would need to start out with a titration, which is rather broad, right? Huge steps so that you can see where is this linear range? Because most likely, if you have not done this before, um, you don't know that. Yeah. So that would be, would say, the most important part. Know where in this dose response curve you are. And do this with a broad titration at the beginning, and then repeat it with a more um, granulated titration in the linear range. Yeah, but we have that sometimes, that we have our customers um, who like, I don't know, compare cytokines or test cytokines. And they say, yeah, it doesn't make a difference how much I apply. I can use 10 times less, there's no difference. And they say, yeah, that's because you are in the saturation with it. And uh, but which on the other hand, I mean, um, it makes, means they can like save 10 times, can save 10 times uh, uh, the money they spend on cytokines, right? So it's definitely worth doing that. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fingen. Did you have any final comments for our audience today? Um, other than I would say, thank you a lot for staying for staying uh, with us this long. Um, and uh, I would say no. Maybe one remark would be if, if you have any questions, I mean, you know how it is. Sometimes these don't pop up immediately when you are listening to something like that. Um, feel free to contact us. Yeah. So we're always happy to, to help and, and to answer questions. Thank you again, Dr. Franken, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Miltony Biotech, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye.